My name is Maura Curran. I'm Vice Chair of the Board of Selectmen, and I want to welcome you to, I think, what is our third public meeting to discuss the renourishment project in Hummerock, which includes a road elevation as well as some beach renourishment. I want to thank Nancy Durfee, our Coastal Resource Officer, for continuing to communicate to all of you, as well as for organizing this and working very closely with our engineers from Applied Coastal. Tonight we'll have a presentation from John Ramsey, who's the lead engineer on this project, and his assistant, Morgan Gelinas, is here as well. The um, presentation will last about 30 minutes. We are going to ask that you write down and hold any questions until the end of those 30 minutes. And we also ask that you come to the microphone over here down below to ask any of your questions, um, mainly because this is being recorded. It'll go up on the YouTube town page and also run on community TV for folks that aren't able to attend this evening. So we really appreciate your cooperation and going to the mic to ask any questions. And Nancy and myself will help moderate that. And I also want to welcome Jason Bertner and Rebecca Haney, both from Coastal Zone Management, who have also been instrumental in their assistance throughout this entire project, as well as many of the projects that we have before us um, to address our coastal resiliency needs in situate. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John, and he will commence with his presentation for all of you. Uh, good evening. Um, as as Moore had mentioned, this is our third public meeting uh, regarding the project, so I'm hoping that you all picked up uh, the flyers that were out front. Um, so I'm not going to go over a, a lot of the information that was presented in two of the previous public meetings. So um, I'm hoping that uh, you can go to the website. The town website actually has all of the previous presentations as well as the reports that have been done. And you can catch up on a lot of the information regarding all the alternatives we looked at to get to the point we are now. And uh, also the process, some of the questions that have been asked uh, that have gotten us to uh, where we are as, as far as the project goes. Um, the project limits, um, what we're looking at is a, a project that extends from t 10 Cliff Road South all the way down to 130 Central Avenue. Um, that's the, the large project. I'm going to be talking also tonight about phasing the project. This is a very large project, the, the limits we're looking at which is uh, about 4,800 feet, almost a mile. So we're looking at a, a, a length of project that is uh, you know, somewhere on the order of $10 million to build. So one of the things the town is going to be looking at is phasing the project. And so I'll be talking about that in a little bit. And we'll probably we'll be focusing on the northern area uh, for our first phase. One of the things I, I didn't present last time, but I think it's very instructive uh, on some of the questions, you know, how the, the beach has changed over time and how the dune system's changed over time. And one of the things that uh, we kind of look at is when we start first start developing this area, we, we know that in, in 1898, the Portland Gale opened the inlet and uh, changed it so the town of Situate ended up getting split in two. Um, but one of the things we, we really don't talk about much is when we started developing this site. And one of the things you see is in the 1940s is, is really the, the heyday or the, the, the time when all of a sudden this area started getting developed. And from the postcards, this is uh, from Fourth Cliff looking south. Um, you can see the cottage development starting to, to form along the dune here. And then on the, in this postcard, this is actually looking up towards Fourth Cliff, but this from the backside on the river. And one of the things you see is a very well formed dune, something we don't see anymore uh, in this area. Uh, certainly the dune is still uh, made of exactly what we see now, which is the, the cobbles and uh, gra rounded gravel as well as sand. But one of the things that you also see is you know, the, the overwash had not started occurring. So we actually saw along the road, you can see armoring that's, that's along the road that is now buried with the overwash that's occurred over the last um, you know, half century or so. And so this sort of gives you an idea of what the map looked like in 1947, where all of a sudden this area started getting developed and we had the roadway and you can start seeing the cottage development uh, going up through North Hummer Rock. So that sort of gives you the kind of the, the baseline of what we're really trying to restore the shore protection back to, to a, a time period when you know, the shoreline could resist a lot of the northeast storms that we started to see um, affecting the area more and more as, as we start losing more and more sediment along the beach. 
obviously we, we had a, a doozy of a winter. Um, I was up here many, many times, uh, I have to say. Um, you know, between the January Northeaster and the series of Northeasters we had in March, it was, it was a very tough year. Um, this just gives you uh, uh, some of the pictures for those of you who tried to avoid the area during the winter and, and came down for the summer. Um, this, this is sort of what it looked like uh, a couple days after the March Northeaster. And one of the things we see is septic systems uncovered. Really, the, the dune had been completely eroded under the houses. This is after a, a few days, people had started moving material back in front of the houses. But for the most part, a lot of the material that was on the berm or the dune had been washed over the road, and the road was completely blocked for several days. I'll give you a, f a few more pictures, um, and this is a, a site visit we had f with the regulatory agencies uh, during a site visit, but you can see the, the, the uh, up by Atlantic Avenue, all the overwash that occurred, and uh, the, the lack of beach. Basically, what we were seeing is we were there very close to low tide, and even at that time, the water was still coming over the beach uh, from the waves. So, you know, obviously, the, the uh, storm had moved a lot of material back. It's no big surprise. I'm sure all of you have been through this before, um, but that's uh, you know something that we're trying to uh, mitigate for as part of this project. So it's a very important aspect that we understand how the beach works during these storms. So one of the things that we look at, and I think uh, one of the things that was very instructive to us, uh, we, we always talked about this when we are designing this project and some, some of the stuff we talked about last year, was this concept that there's two ways that this area gets flooded. One side is the river side. Your road is very low. Central Avenue is low. So when you get flooding from the river side, you can get water coming over and just blocking it during high tide. So even if you haven't had waves coming over the dune at that point, your, your road's blocked because it's flooded. On the other hand, we also get different kinds of storms that may not have the highest high tides, but they last for a very long period of time and they have very large waves. And those types of storms tend to push the dune back, clog the road, partially because of flooding, but mainly because there's feet of material that cover Central Avenue. It takes days to clear. And so what we had in this past year was two ideal examples of those two worst cases. The first one occurred from January 3rd to the 6th, and it had it basically tied the 1978 storm for the worst storm surge that was seen in Boston. But the blessing of that storm was it was very, very fast moving. So it was a very high tide, but basically you had one high tide cycle, and you had waves height greater than 10 feet only over a one day period, which seems like a lot, but when it really comes down to it, that didn't really have enough to, to really do a huge job of clogging the road, but basically most of your problems were flooding from the backside. And you saw that especially down in Marshfield when you went down to the South River, you saw all those properties down the South River that were completely flooded out during that storm. The March storms were a different animal altogether. The tides were not nearly as high. I should, should say they were fairly high, but they were not nearly as high, but we had many days in a row, six days in a row, where we had waves offshore of greater than 10 feet. And when you get those waves of that height, they just keep pushing the water over the top of the beach. And again, no big surprise, but you ended up with, in some cases, six to eight feet of fill on your road because it just kept pushing back day after day after day. And so your road was closed for basically over a week. Um, and uh, you know, it really is a different kind of storm. And so what we're doing with this project is we're actually trying to deal with both sides, trying to make sure that we're mitigating for that issue of flooding from the riverside, at the same time trying to maintain that berm system during a severe storm so you're not getting the overtopping flooding at the same time. So we always talk about uh, you know, how bad it was this winter, and, and I know a lot of people have been through a lot this winter, but you know, compared to the 78 storm where this is North Hummer Rock, I mean, you can see the houses here, um, and you saw that th everywhere in, uh, you know, throughout Situate. Um, so that was really the combination of both. You had a very high storm tide, but you also had a, a storm that lasted for several days. And because of those two effects, you know, again, obviously you got the feet of burial. You're, again, you're looking up towards Fourth Cliff up here. You know, these are the houses that are on the dune along Hummer Rock. And you know, obviously one of the things that happens is you got a lot of, a lot of material moving and uh, creating some serious problems. But I, I want to point this out more from the standpoint of, again, what we're really trying to do is mitigate for this type of storm. The types of storms we had this winter were really bad, but it can be worse 
And you know, the Portland gale, the 78 storm, and even the 91 storm were actually worse than, than what we experienced this winter. So again, I just want to return to uh, sort of our project limits. And again, this is an aerial photograph. You see these blue lines here. These blue lines are showing where we have uh, coastal armoring. So it's either a revetment, the, the, the jumble of stones, or it's a seawall or a combination of both. And obviously these seawalls are not continuous. Uh, they're, they're kind of broken up, and it, this probably does not include them all. Uh, this is uh, from a survey that Coastal Zone Management had done from aerial photographs. But it gives you an idea. We know that we have some structures along this barrier beach, but they are not continuous, and it's not something that forms a, a barrier to waves going over the beach. Um, and again, we're looking at this whole system, and this system is a barrier beach. Um, and, and again, I don't want to get into what we've looked at before, but one of the issues with barrier beaches um, is with the issue of coastal armoring. Um, we have uh, regulations against doing coastal armoring, new coastal armoring on barrier beaches, and everybody says, well, we'd love to armor all this, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But what it really comes down to is very good reasons why we don't armor barrier beaches. Um, one of the functions of these types of beaches is actually to naturally dissipate wave energy and naturally re reduce the wave energy. And that's sort of the avenue that we've gone to try to actually return this beach to a, a form that allows it to serve as its own protection rather than trying to armor. And I'll talk about armoring a little bit in a little bit. Um, so, you know, in simple terms, again, what we're trying to do is look from the riverside. We know we have riverside flooding that goes over Central Avenue um, just from storm surge. On, on the other side of the beach, we have a dune system that, you know, if it was just still water, it wouldn't get overtopped. But we also know with the waves pushing up against the shoreline that you get that, that roll of surge that's going to go right over the top of the dunes and push them back. So we're really trying to deal with both, both issues at the same time with one project. Uh, this, this is uh, just a picture from a storm to give you, an idea, you know, again, the idea. Uh, again, any of you have been out there in the winter, you see this all the time, where the dunes relatively low, um, and then we, when we have storm waves come over, they just have overwash, and they flood the road out, bring material in, and, uh, and then basically we, it, between the material that's brought in as well as the flooding, you really lose the emergency access that's really needed uh, to go across or down Central Avenue. And so again, returning to this, uh, it's one thing that we just keep pointing out. Um, you know, the, the difference is you notice how high this dune is. You know, I don't have a survey from back when this was done, but one of the things we did observe, you know, is that we, over time, the repetitive loss from FEMA, the, the number of claims have increased over time. It's not a surprise. Um, certainly, I've talked to enough contractors out on the beach who you know, said we used to come out here you know, once every five years to clean out this lot when there's a major northeaster. Now it's like every year, sometimes two or three times a year, trying to clean out the lots or, or clear off the road and, and move the material back on the beach. And a lot of that is, is because this dune or this, this cobble berm has lost its volume and it has no ability to stop even minor northeasters from going over the top. And clearly, uh, you know, this is an emergency egress. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, this is not just the properties along Central Avenue, uh, but it's also properties up on Fourth Cliff. And this, the picture here is just really just showing, you know, that level of river that floods from the backside. At that time, you, you actually had some materials coming over the road as well. But again, you know, this road really ends up being impassable at many locations just during, you know, your typical Northeaster. I mean, this is just a, more of a, a close-up of that, uh, that January storm where we, uh, again, we just had the, you know, really no storm, and then all of a sudden that storm just peaked right up, but within 24 hours it was gone. Um, and it really does cause that, that type of, of situation where the, the river flooding comes right up on the backside. And I said, you know, as I said, that whole South River issue, um, you know, it really was noticeable. You know, when we came up and visited here, all the way down South River, um, all the way in the backside of Hummer Rock was actually, it's, there was more flood damage on the backside uh, than a lot of the front side during that storm in many areas. And so as I said, uh, or I mentioned, you know, we're really not just looking at the homes along, 
along Central Avenue, but we're also, one of the things the town has an obligation to do is to provide emergency access and emergency egress to the homes up on Fourth Cliff. So these, all these homes are, or most of those homes there are, are well out of the floodplain, um, but they are, uh, you know, 57 homes up here that the town really needs to maintain that access to. Um, so one of the things, obviously, that we looked at in the concept of uh, alternatives was, you know, what, what would happen if we don't do anything and we just let the beach go away or breach, et cetera. And really the town um, and, and the state to some level have, have that commitment to make sure you maintain access uh, to develop communities. So really that's, you know, one of the linchpins. It's not just the access to the homes along Central Avenue, but it's also the access to homes that are that are uh, actually well out of the floodplain, and all that access and utilities, etc., need to be, be maintained. So, we, with the uh, the concept of, of what we're looking at, one of the one of the uh, tenets that we went through last year was looking at how the road varied in elevation. This is uh, how the road varies in elevation. Uh, and this is really vertically exaggerated, but it, you know, all these arrows are on a map kind of showing you where we are. And the, the elevation of the road varies from about six and a half feet, and this is six and a half feet above mean sea level, all the way up to on the little bit above 10 feet. Now the dash line here is the, uh, the, what we call the still water elevation, and that's the elevation of just surge, no waves, just the, the storm surge you get during a 10 year storm. Um, and that just shows you how much of the road, anything under that line, that road is underwater at the high tide during a 10 year storm. And then during a 100 year storm, it's the, the dark blue line, the, the, the non-dash line, and you see that pretty much all of the road, for the most part, is underwater. And then even in the one year storm down here, we have these areas that are, you know, where we show possible breach. Even during a one year storm, the storm that you experience every single year on average, um, basically your, your road is underwater for at least the, a high tide portion. And so obviously one of the issues we're concerned about is these low-lying areas here and here, but this one specifically, because the beach is also very narrow at the north end, and so what we're looking at is, a, is an area where we have a, a very narrow beach and a low road, and there is concern that that would be a breach, and meaning a breach that uh, of a new tidal inlet could form there and really eliminate any access up to uh, uh, Fourth Cliff. So we're, we're concerned about that, and that's why that area actually became the focus of, of our first phase. So one of the things we looked at, and this is for the whole project, this whole 4,800 feet, is actually raising the road elevation. In the northern area, we can get away with 10 feet above mean sea level, which gets us above the 100-year still water elevation. So in any storm, even a 100-year storm, you're not going to flood from the backside. When we go further south, we get down to about 9.5 feet, and the reason for that is, has a lot to do with the driveways, et cetera. The houses, as you go further south, have driveways that are a lot closer to the road. And one of the things we don't want to do is we don't want to tip the road towards everybody's house and cause them to flood if, in, or trap water behind uh, the roadway. So we're, we're cognizant of that issue. Um, so we're able to do it higher, further north, but then we have to drop it lower as we go further south. Um, and then, of course, our, our doozy storm uh, in March, and actually you can see the second Northeaster come in right after it. But again, we had several days where, you know, the, the Central Avenue minimum elevation for five days in a row, you had water coming over the road at high tide. So even if you were able to clear the road, which it took us that long, it took the town that long to get the road cleared, even if we were able to clear it, the flooding was coming from the backside anyways. So, you're, so you know, the road was really impassable at high tide for, for many tide cycles. And so just looking at some of the, the issues that we saw when we were out there, um, you know, when we, when we have that kind of beach erosion, one of the things that happens is the septic systems become uncovered. Uh, this is one picture of one. And this next picture is actually, this next series of pictures is actually kind of interesting. This is actually uh, uh, looking north at one location, and if you turn around and you look south, it's the same location. And it just gives you an idea of one, one of the things that everybody always feels that, that seawalls, you know, they, they hold the line, they're a great way of protecting my home. Um, this is kind of interesting in the sense that when you have houses on piles, yes, you get a lot of storm surge coming up, you get the waves pushing the berm back, but what they end up doing is they push the berm back right onto the road. 
and the house itself, if you actually look at the front of these houses, there was actually no, no real damage. I mean, obviously the piles got hit, there was, there was damage to these homes, but the structural side of it wasn't, it really wasn't catastrophic. You turn south and you look at the seawall, and one of the things that happens is, you know, with the waves uprushing, when they hit a vertical seawall, the waves shoot straight up, and all that water, as well as all this, the, the stones that are picked up, also just slam against the house. And the, the weight of that water and the weight of those stones obviously causes a lot of damage. And one of the things you see is the whole, you know, this is a blue tarp, this is a blue tarp. We saw that a series down, going down the way. And again, this is not saying that seawalls are awful and that, that, uh, that berm nourishment's perfect, but it is giving you sort of the indication that, you know, for everybody who feels that seawalls are the answer, there are some issues um, and, you know, it does create a very different wave environment and it, it does have its own issues. And one of the things we can look at going through the process of, of designing and analyzing things is we look down the coast and we really don't see um, you know, any, you know, the, the areas that have seawalls and don't have seawalls, we see damage, FEMA damage and major damage to homes you know, throughout, regardless of whether they have a seawall or not. So uh, I presented something similar to this last time, uh, but I just wanted to, to show it again. This is what we're proposing. So this is a, what, you know, again, people look at beach nourishment, they look at dune nourishment. This is something at a very different scale than probably what you're used to seeing. This is a, you know, this is a very large dune that is made of what we call mixed sediment. So it's a combination of what's on the beach. It's cobble, gravel, and sand mixed together. Um, and what ends up happening is the waves will sort it. Um, but we're talking about something that has an elevation that's about almost 20 feet above mean sea level and has a very wide berm that, that is 30 feet at the top but slopes. And again, this is virtually, vertically exaggerated, so try not to take it too much to scale. But it, it is something that you know, we're looking at something on the order of 250,000 yards or on the order of, of uh, about... Uh, 12,000 to 13,000 truckloads of material that would be brought in to do the entire project. So there's a large scale project, um, but it gives you an idea of, of what the elevation would be. This is the typical uh, decks that we have along the road. Um, and so it gives you the, the idea of the sight line. So if you were um, standing, you can certainly see over uh, the berm that we'd be constructing. And the reason why we need this berm of this size is really to deal with a few things. It's to, to deal with you know, our, our sea level, and one of the things we have is we have this nine and a half feet still water elevation. That's, that's our, our storm surge. So that's, that's how high the water gets during a hundred year storm. But on top of that, we have waves and everybody's seen it. Uh, in this area, our waves are, our wave envelope is around 17 feet above mean sea level. And again, that shouldn't surprise anybody from what they've seen out there. And so it's very critical that we are well above that, we're about two and a half feet above that. So what we're trying to do is trip the waves up and make them dissipate their energy on the front of this berm rather than getting over it. And the other, so the other one concept is it needs to be high. The other concept is it needs to have the proper width and volume so that it can withstand the duration of the storm. If you made a very narrow berm, what would end up happening is during the first tide cycle that we saw, that would, that would collapse down and then the next tide cycle coming up would go over it. So this is designed with a volume to withstand that whole concept of a major storm. And so this is really, really the same slide again, but it gives you an idea of what the berm ends up doing. And again, this is, a, again, very exaggerated, but I just want to give you an idea. We build this berm to this wonderful dimensions, but it doesn't stay that way and everybody knows that. Um, but what it does do is it, it's going to form these, this kind of, uh, uh, it's going to kind of form this berm that's right above mean high water. So basically the average waves that come up on a daily basis, they kind of form that first crest of a berm. You see that on the, you know, the natural beach now, you kind of see a little, on the sand, you kind of see this little kind of crest that goes a little bit above high tide. This is going to be a little bit more exaggerated than that. But, and then you get the, a second crest way up at, at the, the peak of where the waves roll up to. But again, this is going to, so when, even though this looks like a, a very straight, flat, steep form, again, it's vertically exaggerated, it's not gonna be that steep. Um, but when the waves actually work through it, you're gonna end up with that 
flattish beach that you are used to out in front, you know, from a little bit above mean high water out. So the, the beach itself, the lower part of the beach that you typically walk is not really going to change. You're really just changing that, that volume of, of berm that's up above it. Uh, this is a, more of a stretched out version of even that, but it, at least it gives you a, more of the, the whole cross section from where we're talking about elevating the road, give you an idea of what the house looks like, the, how, what your view would be over the berm, and again, that profile uh, going out. And this is, this is still vertically exaggerated a bit, but it still gives you, kind of gives you more of an idea uh, of what the whole thing would look like. And again, so keep in mind what that volume of material is you know, you're looking at, this is kind of the scale of a house, so you're looking at that volume of material being placed out in front of the home. So, um, I alluded to the concept of phasing, and again, so we're really focused on doing phase one, um, and that's what we are uh, trying to move forward with, or the town's trying to move forward with in the concept of permitting. Um, and that phase is looking at the first 1,800 feet, the northern 1,800 feet, raising the road up to the 10 feet NAVD, and also constructing that berm um, over that 1,800 feet as well. And again, this is the area that's most vulnerable to uh, a potential breach. Um, it also has some of the highest flood damage, so we want to uh, we want to try to take a look at at that as well. Um, so last year, uh, we went through this process, and I know it got confusing, and I'm going to confuse you again tonight just to make sure that I've, I've got everybody on the same page. But one of the things we did last year is we went through, and we, we kind of categorized all your homes into what type of driveway improvement, et cetera. If we raise the road, what, what's going to be needed to be done? Um, but rather than belaboring this, one thing I will say, by phasing this project, the northern 1,800 feet has very few issues relative to, to driveways, so it ends up being uh, a lot easier for us to deal with. Um, so nearly all the homes, 25 homes in this area, and these are all homes that are on the east side of the road, um, are elevated homes. And what we would be doing, if we raise the road, we would also be filling the elevation of the driveway up, so the elevation of the driveway is just as high as the road. So that would be, you know, so if you have a home there, your, your driveway's not going to drop down, your driveway's just going to be elevated to the same elevation as a road, and so you might have one or two less, fewer stairs to climb to get in your home. But that's, that's really all this is for most of the properties. Um, there certainly are a couple of more uh, challenging um, ones, but nothing that's, that's nearly as challenging as the homes further south. Um, so we have five homes where they're not elevated, but we're still able to have a flat driveway so that the homes are high enough so that even if we did a flat driveway, we're not sloping back down. So there'd be fill, but your driveway would be a little bit higher, but it would still not slope down towards your property. And then there are three homes where we do have some slopes to issues to, to deal with, but um, in these three cases, and it's actually two locations, we'd ensure that there was some sort of drainage underneath the road that would make sure that that flow would not build up at the house, but would be able to flow back out to the river when the water dropped. And of course, we have uh, six homes on the other side of the road. Um, none of these are really a challenge from the elevation standpoint because it's, it's, it's very easy. They're all at high enough elevation that the, the road is actually not higher than the homes. The biggest issue here is there are actually, specifically one house has a very nice driveway. I'm sure you guys all know who that person is. Um, so it would just be making sure that we're um, you know, tapering that driveway in um, to the elevation of the road and, and ensuring that that's, that's done in a, uh, a way that, that works with the homeowner. But for the most part, these would just be, you know, the, the elevations would just be tapered into those homes on the other side. So really, for that whole 1,800 foot section, there really aren't any very difficult homes to deal with as far as uh, um, any issues regarding um, worries that, w that we're going to have any drainage problems, et cetera. Um, one of the things that came up last year is there's a fear that, you know, especially the way the roads plowed after a storm, that sometimes there's a berm set up and it trapped water on the, on the, on the beach. Um, so obviously, if we build the berm, we're not going to have that water. But even if we did, the way this is designed, that it would be able to run off into the river without a problem. 
Uh, just a quick note on uh, beach sediments. You know, everybody always wants, and I'm, you know, uh, more at, at alluded to a beach nourishment. Me being an engineer, it's kind of a different thing for me. This is actually a, 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 you know, a dune or berm nourishment project as opposed to a, a beach nourishment project. We did look at beach nourishment projects um, you know, that are more sandy and trying to maintain the beach, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, but really, from a design life standpoint and the, the nature of this beach system, we really want to uh, do something that enhances this dune because that's really what is protecting you guys from you know, really severe storm damage. It's something that, that works very well if, if it has the proper volume and elevation. Um, so with that, the sediments that we're proposing here are a mixture of, of this cobble, gravel, and sand. Um, nature sorts the sand out anyways. Um, we, we would be putting in a mixed sediment source. But one of the things, you know, obviously, you know, you know, I've been out there enough times, certainly in the summer, we see the sandier material come in from the bars that are offshore, and the cobbler material ends up higher on the beach. Uh, this is the same type of thing we you know, expect, and the same time, type of thing that we've seen in other projects we've done, where you get natural sorting. So the higher part, the higher part of the dune, is going to be sorted into cobble by the higher, highly energetic waves, and the finer grain material is going to form the beach, the, the type of beach that you're used to, which is kind of a mixed sediment beach anyways, down in the lower profile, the lower part of the beach in the intertidal zone. And as I said, we did look at beach nourishment, and I didn't want to talk about this because there does uh, it, uh, tend to be a little bit of confusion about this. Uh, the beach nourishment for a project of this type in, in the area that we're talking about um, requires about twice as much material. Um, it doesn't last as long, six years versus 10 years. And when we're talking about the 10 years and six years, it's actually, the, there's also a maintenance issue. We're looking at most of the material going away for beach nourishment, where it would actually be eroded, and, and it would provide a benefit to other beaches down drift, but it doesn't, wouldn't provide any storm damage protection basically after six years, and you'd have to basically rebuild the project. Um, where you know, we're looking at design life of 10 years, but again, with a much lower um, maintenance cost, because we can actually, one of the things that we're talking about with this project is you're actually very much like Manhill Beach. You're going to be allowed to manipulate this, or the town's going to be allowed to manipulate this to, uh, you know, it's sort of a contiguous berm that you're going to be setting up. And as it, if it lowers in a certain elevation that you would be able to fix it uh, and, and get, bring its storm damage pr uh, protection back. And I, I always laugh because I am an engineer, so we always have to have a curve or something like this. But this is, uh, this is kind of what the, the berm versus the breach nourishment looks like from my standpoint, uh, where you're looking at 100% of the material I, I place at day one, and then over time it just uh, moves on down the beach. And one of the things we see is we do beach nourishment. By, by year six, we're really down to 30%, and we really need to start doing something. Uh, we actually need to bring material back. Uh, the berm nourishment, you know, even after uh, 10 years or 15 years, we're, we're still at 40%. So we really have a much better design life, a much, you know, obviously this, it's harder for waves to move larger material. So it's, it's not, not a big surprise. Um, how do we get material here? Um, you know, unfortunately, one of the, the, the tough things about Massachusetts is trying to find are trying to permit offshore sediment sources is very difficult. Um, so the way we've looked at this project is we'd be trucking it in. Uh, unfortunately, the truck route mainly goes through Marshfield, um, but at the same time, this, this is really the way you'd have to do the project. Um, and if we, for just for phase one, we'd be looking about 40, 4,500, 4,600 truckloads of material. Um, this project would take about six months to construct, and you know, certainly it would be done during the, the winter months as opposed to during the summer. I talked about uh, maintenance, um, and, and again, so since this is like an engineered berm, it's not like a, we're not setting, making a natural dune system. This is a, an engineered berm. And one of the things that we would be doing is monitoring it over time, and once it got down to a certain volume, in this case, once it got down to about 60%, we'd start planning um, for some type of, of re-nourishment or fixing the, what we, we call the hot spots, the, the areas where we've lost the most material. Um, and once it gets down to about 50% of the volume, as opposed to a beach nourishment, we would actually come in and fill because one of the things we're doing here is it's not just about you know, supplying sediment. This is actually your shore protection. So we want to make sure 
that once it drops below a certain elevation or the, the berm width gets too narrow, that we need to come in and refill because if we don't have that buffer, then one of those major storms can come in and, and, and tear the, the project out. So really once, if we, once we see some sections that drop about three feet, you know, we're, we're suggesting going in and actually fixing those spots and making sure you're bringing the berm back up to the right elevation to make sure that it's, it's going to, to withstand uh, storms. And so uh, this is sort of where we're at. Um, so right now, one of the things I'd like to point out is we're at the point where we have what's called an environmental notification form that we filled out and are ready to submit. This is the project, the whole project, not the phase project, just so we get feedback from the regulatory agencies. This is not a permit, but it is the first foray into the permitting environment to, to see if the, the community wants to go forward with it. Um, so we're ready to submit that. Um, but with that, if the town uh, and the community want to proceed with this whole concept, you know, then, then it starts getting into the actual permits. It's the notice of intent locally, as well as a bunch of state permits, specifically the Chapter 91. Uh, and the Chapter 91 is, is kind of a state's, uh, state rights type permit. And one of the things, if public money is used for a project, you know, those projects require public access easements. So that's, that's part of the state permitting process. It's, it's kind of a requirement. Um, so I just want to point that out. Um, but you know, we're ready, as I said, we're ready to file our permits at the end of this week, or this, the, the ENF at the end of this week. We're not planning on submitting any other permits until you know, the, the community decides to, to move forward with uh, any, you know, gets all the easements and everything else in place and decides that th this is a route they want to take. Um, but we would, you know, right now we would be ready to submit um, the Chapter 91 sometime in mid-September. So that's sort of the, the timeline that we're looking at. Um, so it gives uh, sort of an idea of, of where, uh, how the town would want to proceed. So it kind of gives this whole summer for everybody to kind of take their breath and, and look at the project and, and uh, see how we want to move forward. I'll just give you a little bit of information on the, f the phasing because we, we talked about the whole project last time in some detail. Uh, we are looking at uh, you know, somewhere around $3.6 million just to do phase one. So this is that, that phase that, uh, you know, that goes to 1,800 feet. Um, and it's all raising the road, which is about $400,000, and then uh, about $3.2 million. And again, that's, that's about $1,800 per linear foot. So if you guys know how long your lot is, you can kind of figure out you know, the level of, of financial commitment the town uh, and, and or their cost sharing partners would be, would be putting into something like this. Uh, this cost does not include a couple of the things uh, that, that are a bit of a concern. Uh, we did look at some of these from an engineering standpoint. There are some, you know, we, we certainly have not dealt with a lot of the septic system issues yet because there's, there's uh, I'll say there's a lack of information on many of your lots. Um, but for the most part, you know, a lot of these issues, especially in phase one, a lot of these issues are, are relatively simple um, because of the, uh, the, way that this, the way that the driveways would be done. Uh, there's very few paved driveways. There are, are certainly a handful, but on the east side of the road, there are, are few paved driveways, so that makes it a little simpler. Um, and the, the relocation of utilities is, is really not that, that big of an issue. It's, uh, I think the town would be looking at, you know, the town will be looking at putting in a new water line, but that's, that's really the main utility that, that requires um, any sort of construction. Um, so I, with that, I'll open up questions. Uh, but before I do, I just want to point out, so we have some, uh, and some, I saw some of you looking at the, these earlier. Uh, we do have the plans that we're planning on submitting with this environmental notification form. Um, actually, I, I shouldn't say that. These, form, these plans are actually for the phased project. So these are the ones who would, that would actually be submitted with the permits if we went forward with that 1,800 foot section. So uh, it gives you an idea of, of the, the limits of the project and a little bit more details on what the berm looks like and, and you can kind of look, see property by property uh, what things look like. So with that, I'll open up for questions. Thank you, John. As you can see, this is a really important project for your neighborhood. Uh, this is one of many projects that have been identified in the town of Situate that need to be addressed. We probably have approximately $100 million worth of projects to fortify our coast from Minot, Glades Beach, all the way down to Hummerock. So we've chosen this project 
as a priority right now um, because we feel that it's probably one of the most, if not the most vulnerable area along our coastline. However, the big piece really sits with all of you with regards to the easements because that is the only way that this project will move forward. And I know um, it's a very controversial topic, but it's a reality and we had this chat last summer. So I just wanted to put that out there before you um, think of questions that you want to come forward and ask that the easements are required for this to move forward and to really, when you're thinking about that, to consider that there are other projects in town that we will look at if Hummer Rock is not ready to take this on. And that's just the, the real um, honest truth um, of the situation that we have here in Situate facing us. So if you weren't here in the beginning, um, please come on down to the mic and ask a question. We have uh, Nancy Durfee here, myself, but also obviously John Ramsey, um, our engineer, who will uh, take any of your questions. And uh, I think um, since it is, uh, no, you know, your, ad your name and address would be helpful, just so we, we know who we're talking to. Thank you. John, thank you for the presentation, and thank you uh, to Situate for considering this, because I do think it's important. I think it goes without saying that this is a little bit of a conundrum for all of us. Um, Can you lean into the mic a little bit? Now you're in my position. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? Watch you sign while you're asking. I, no, I, what I said is I want to thank John for, for the presentation and for the town of Situa for considering this, uh, but I do think that we're all in a bit of a conundrum about the whole project. Um, my question, I actually have three questions. Um, in that photograph, the, the home that's uh, to the farthest to the right at the very edge of the film, that's 260 Central Avenue, um, and this uh, past weekend, I went out there and took a two, lashed two poles together that were 19 and a half feet tall. And if I had the drawings correct, because they drove by, I think on Thursday, and dropped off some of these drawings, I marched off the back of my deck 50 feet, where I sort of, from the diagram, figured that that would be where the middle part of the dune would be, and the maximum height of 19.5 feet. So please correct me if I'm wrong. But um, when I put that 19-foot pole, my sister Catherine was the one holding the pole up, I could not see anything other than the sky. There was literally zero view of anything water at that height. And um, my deck, if you, the, yeah, and the, even in that photograph, I have a, you know, an old concrete deck that was owned by Stanley Woodard, and he had that back in '78. It's a, it's a huge deck. So I mean, it, it's it's some elevation off of the off of the beach. So when I looked at this pictorial um, with the line of sight, it doesn't bear any any, um, you know, this doesn't match up. When I when I marched out 19 feet. And so, I, like I said, I took the edge, it was about 450 on the diagrams that you provided here, and I went out 50 feet from the edge, and then went, had the pole there at 19 feet. Right. And there's absolutely no view of the water whatsoever. Okay. Can you uh, comment? Let me, let me, let me uh, so I think that one of the things uh, is, is that this berm is not 19 and a half feet high. This berm is to an elevation of 19 and a half. If you're out here, the beach is actually at, about six feet. So you know you should be looking at something that's a bit six feet lower, about thirteen feet, thirteen and a half feet. Okay. Okay. So so it's an elevation as opposed to um, necessarily a um, you know don't go out and hold a nineteen and a half foot staff. Okay. But I think what you need to do is make sure that you're you know again it goes up to an elevation of nineteen and a half feet above um, mean sea level. And if you look at your you know the road, I'm not exactly sure what the elevation of the road is at your house. So I'm you're only going to proposing to put the road up one feet from at 260. Okay, so you're you're at nine feet now. So really, okay. if you look at about the elevation of the berm would be about 10 feet above the road. 10 feet above the road. Okay. okay. But it's, yeah, I it, mean, it's only, that's hard to get a line of sight from the front of the house to the back of the I house understand. to really get a sense <laughs> of how high this berm is going to be. And I think we're kind of all in that same predicament is, you know, I, I 
clearly get the need for the berm and to protect the houses. On the other hand, if there's, if you can't see anything out the back of the house, you know. And that's fair enough. I, I think one of the things, and, and from our standpoint, you know, one of the things that we were very cognizant of is staying off of private property. Um, you know, obviously during the storms, I kind of walked around a few houses, but I'm not going to go and take elevation measurements of the houses. No. I have, you know, a good idea of what the elevations of a lot of the, the uh, decks, et cetera, are from LIDAR, which is the, you know, the aerial surveys. Yeah. But one of the things that would be helpful if you, uh, all of you are concerned, is if you have home plans, et cetera, that you know what the elevation of your deck is, that will give us an idea. Um, and so we can actually provide, you know, more sightline information. We just, I just can't go and invade your houses and get all the elevations for your decks, sure. if, that's, if that makes sense. Okay. And for the most part, you know, a lot of your decks are, are at fairly similar elevations along the way. So it's, uh, it, it's not... Uh, I, I think we did a fairly good representation, but but if there are some that are lower, then it would be nice to know for us as well. Okay. Okay. Um, the other question was, when you when this comes about to be needed to be refurbished at any point, so you said when it drops below three feet, then the idea would be to go out to re-nourish the uh, berm. Is that going to, when would that happen? Does that happen during the winter months, or is that going to happen during the spring, or when does that sort of, how does that play um, into the planning? Well, I, can, I can tell you that, I mean, one of, the th one of the things we see is at Manhill Beach, if you're familiar with that, a little further north, obviously one of the things the town does is after Northeaster, they patch it up. And so, that's, so that patch would be done immediately after storm because the storms seem to come in pairs or threes as, as we see this winter. Um, but if there's more volume that needs to be brought in, just like the construction project, that typically is done off season. Nobody, nobody the dump truck people do not want to fight you guys in the summer trying to go down the road. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's much easier to do the construction in the winter. So, you know, certainly that, that is typically the time frame. It keeps us, if there's fisheries issues, et cetera, it keeps us out of all of those windows with, with any sort of, you know, fish species, birds, et cetera. So we're much better off doing that type of work in the winter. And I, my assumption is that for what, if this project does not go through and we've signed the easement, then, the, then those signatures are null and void. Correct. Um, okay. I was saying that if the project doesn't go through and we've signed the easement, then obviously all of this is null and void. Our signatures are, are we still have private beaches. So it's not a permanent, it's only a permanent easement should the project go through. Correct. No, no, I'm just saying if. Right. It's, just a, it's just a hypothetical question. I'm, I'm in favor of signing the easement, obviously. But if we sign them and the, pro and the town decides that we're not going through with the project, then obviously, right. You're correct. Yeah. I just wanted to back up on the um, elevation. If you have an elevation certificate to your house or uh, structural plans that show the elevation, we could use that, you know, for this project as well, and it would help, you know, guide what the engineers are trying to do for your property. So, if anyone has those and would like to share them, that would be very helpful. Before I ask the question that I was going to ask, the uh, the um, the assumption that the the assumption that the easement becomes null and void if the project doesn't go forward was something that was discussed in both prior meetings, and the and the last meeting, if I recall, was we'll go back and check that out. I haven't seen anything except for a nodding of the head that that's correct. Is there any, has there been anything in email, writing, anything that's been documented to say if the project doesn't go forward, the easement is null and void? I don't think that it's been placed in writing yet just because we weren't at that juncture, but if you would like that uh, guarantee or verification, we certainly will work through town council and the town administrator to get that so you feel comfortable with that. Because I agree with you, why would you give up the rights if we're not going to proceed with the project? So it makes no sense. So I certainly would advocate on your behalf for that. Okay, thanks. My, my, the, the question I had was, um, there's 57 homes up on the cliff. Um, and if I understood correctly, there's a legal obligation for the town to provide to be able to access it and provide services up there. Um, 
So if this doesn't go through, what's, what's the town's plan B to continue to follow through on the legal obligation to provide services for those 57 homes? So as long as it doesn't breach, you know, we will continue to just do what we're doing today, which is to clear the access so our public safety vehicles can get up there to access Fourth Cliff. Um, we would probably have to look at some sort of bridge solution, um, but that's not going to help the rest of the erosion down at the lower side of Hummer Rock. So there's nothing that has been um, formally evaluated yet, um, but certainly those are options that have been floated out there. Isn't there at this point a real risk that not everybody is going to sign the easement and therefore next winter or any other winter shortly thereafter, mm -hmm. those 57 homes aren't going to be accessible? There's a very big risk, yes. And so there's no plan in place at all by the town? I mean, you're looking at 50-50 at best right now that the easements are going to be signed. Is there no plan in place at all right now? Not at this time. I mean, this is, this is the plan that we've been moving forward with for four years. Um, we've been continuing to educate, to listen. We've consulted coastal zone management. We've consulted engineers. And this is the best forward plan that we have been presented with to date. We understand that it is a partnership with the residents. Um, so we're hoping that you will sign it. We have looked at giving the data September 1st, so you have some additional time to think through this. Um, and at that juncture, we will go to plan B, which is to evaluate, all right, what, what are our second options here? And, and if I understand correctly, does every single resident have to sign the easement for it to go through 100%? Every single resident in phase one. In phase one. Yes. And so if even one doesn't sign, it can't go through. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And, and I believe that the easements only need to be the houses, not that this makes that much of a difference, but on the east side of the road. Um, so we do have six homes on the west side of the road that, are, that don't have those easement issues. You're welcome. Sure. <laughs> you can just turn it toward you. Some people know me here. They uh, don't want me to speak. <laughs> I'm Robert Branco. I live at 164, which is down in the Atlantic Drive area. I face the river, so easements are not a direct concern to me. I have a thought on them, and I will say something. Um, I don't necessarily believe all the charts, um, given the flow and the water and the gravel and the sand that inundated my house. I did not receive much structural damage, thank God, but. Um, certainly, despite your charts, I think it could breach anywhere. The town has allowed, and maybe even started years ago, a gully on the lot next to my river. And um, even in the summer, at high tide, the water is coming from the river because it is lower than the water level. And I can't get anyone to do anything about it. Now, when it rains, the road is eroding, the water is rushing in, eroding. When the tide comes in, it's eroding the other way, and of course in the winter, it, 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 it's worsened. And of course, down at the bend of the road at 98 Central Avenue, thereabouts, um, the water is right up to the road. So, uh, for all you folks, 57 homes on, Fourth Cliff notwithstanding, for all of you folks north of me, you know, it could breach anywhere. And I am behind someone uh, facing the river. I wouldn't trade the river view, as, as most of the people, if you have homes on Central Ave, you wouldn't trade the river view for the ocean, which is static and 
boats on the horizon, perhaps, but I, I would love to have a dune behind me, <laughs> even if I had to climb over it, uh, view notwithstanding. So, uh, and easements, it seems to me, it's almost a moot point. I know there's questions, but with easements, there's no parking, there's no porta parties. Uh, people are not going to walk two miles from, I'm going to say, Clark store to um, down to the end uh, to, to sit on a less than sandy beach with cold water and no parties. So I, I think it's something of a moot point. I, I mean, there's issues, but I, I, I mean, I don't know where you draw this line. But the thing could breach anywhere, even south of me. It could breach. And, and then, who's got access? If it breaches north of me, I don't care. <laughs> but I don't want my taxes to go up. And, this, and this, this public access business, I mean, I'm going to raise another issue. These estimated costs, what's that going to do to my tax bill? Now, I'm not unwilling to pay some more. I'm struggling now. But for crying a lot, if my tax is going to go up significantly because of the cost of this, where's the public money coming from? You know, you shouldn't bite into me. I shouldn't get one dime raised in my taxes if, if people are going to sign all these public access easements and you're going to sell that to the, to the general public. So I, I, I don't know. I got questions about what's it going to do to my tax bill, which is bad enough as it is. On the other hand, the easements, while I understand there are issues and it's not affecting me, it seems to me, a view notwithstanding, uh, you need protection. I see a lot of houses down there where the gravel is, 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 is now uh, less than a foot below the, 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 the floor level of your homes. And I don't know why they aren't being cleaned out because, let me tell you, near me, the houses that are low, the water has come up and under and in. So, uh, and, and it doesn't cease to amaze me what the tide does because when I see uh, these homes down near the fourth cliff that have all these giant rocks that I wish I had, <laughs> they were the worst damaged. Bob? So I, I, I ask that, you know, you would consider the easements from a practical point of view, the view notwithstanding. Um, I think that uh, I, I raise questions that are about the taxes, and um, am I to understand eventually that this, the dune, is, is, is really going to come down pretty much close to Barrett Street? Ultimately, yes, that's correct. Okay. Well, thank you. I thank you, and thank you all. Just hand it off. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Fred Dorr. I've lived in this town since 1941. I've uh, been uh, uh, very concerned about uh, shoreline protection uh, intensely for the last six years, but honestly, uh, that goes back uh, into the 50s. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, last night in the ledger, I read that there were several uh, alternatives that were investigated. One uh, that was missing was um, uh, wave attenuating devices. Um, these uh, devices, or the, the, the right kind of devices, could easily be lo uh, are located beyond the low tide line, which means that there's no need for easements, to my best knowledge. And um, in addition to that, uh, with the right kind of wave attenuating device, this is just a one-time expenditure compared to replenishing the beach perhaps every 10 or so years. Um, in addition to that, uh, the uh, presentation tonight showed that the berm would cost approximately $1,800 per linear foot with the right kind of a wave attenuating device. That price could drop to approximately $1,000 per linear foot. It would be um, a good idea, I think, to investigate even more um, alternatives than the ones that have been uh, selected so far. Thank you. Um, 
I, I think uh, one thing I'd, I'd like to point out is, is actually um, uh, wave attenuation devices were considered. Um, and again, I would refer you to the report that we did last year, uh, looking at alternatives analyses. And you know, I think we went through a, a very uh, thorough analysis. Um, and, and you know, every every shore protection technique has its issues, positive and negative. Um, and one of the, I think I've discussed this before, uh, probably the the issue most important with wave attenuation devices or any type of uh, breakwater type structure is it, it really um, needs to be at such a large scale in order to damp the waves and environment. I mean, you guys have seen the tide range that you have here. Uh, that needs to be such a, a large scale that it really doesn't work um, in, in this type of environment. And uh, again, I think I've said this before, I have designed these types of structures in other places, uh, low tide ranges, um, lower wave environments, they, they work fairly well. Um, but again, this is a, a very different animal and it's a very tough situation for those types of structures. So. Just as a quick response, um, a certain type of wave attenuating device was deployed um, about a month and a half after Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy went up the coast and uh, the uh, sand that was moved offshore to onshore was surprising and um, these uh, devices at this particular location um, did their job as they were designed which was to kill the waves. Thank you. My name is Brad Langmaid. I live south of the protected area on Harvard Street, but we have a sandbar that's protected our house for over 70 years. Will the burn in impact the north-south flow of sediment that feeds that sandbar? Uh, no, it will not. I mean, I, I think one of the things, again, one of the things that we're looking at, be, because this is a mixed sediment berm, one of the things this would do is, is really is also, you know, as you see, that it doesn't have an infinite design life. It is also going to enhance the sediment transport heading south. So if anything, you know, over time, you're, you're going to not see that bar disappear, but it may actually move up in elevation a little bit and provide you better protection. So there will be more, more transport rather than less? Yes. You need to come to the mic if you want to ask a question. The reason is because we are videotaping this, so other folks can also, um, and I can come down with my mic if it's hard to cut down, but go ahead, sir. Hi, um, John Stanton at 130 Central Ave. Uh, I have um, the main question, the broom, the broom is going to come all the way to Barrett? Yes, that, yes it is. Yes. It is. And <laughs> how, how, if everything goes right, how many phases will it take to, to get there? I, I think it sort of depends on the town finances. Uh, you know, we had originally looked at this as one 4,800 foot, the whole project at once. Um, but then when we start talking to the town because of the way funding comes in, um, I think you should look at this as maybe three to four million dollar chunks. So it might be the third phase. But if there's more money available, it could be the second phase. Okay. okay. So, the, but the total to get to Barrett Street, how many how many phases will it be? It, it may be in the second phase. It may be the third phase. Oh, but the third? I, you know, it depends on how the town town finances it. I see. Yeah. But, okay. Oh. So I anticipate most likely three phases, but we would hope to do it in two. And much depends on the willingness of the homeowners and the numbers of easements that are received. The harder it is for us to get the easements, the longer the project will take, the harder it will be for us to find funding. Okay. So, so on the properties between Barrett and Seaview, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the, the, the oceanfront lots, they own 100 feet from Atlantic Drive to, toward the ocean. Correct. So will they have to sign easements? Um, I think it would probably uh, fall into some portion of their property, no. just okay. on the ocean side, not the ones that are behind those homes that really about uh, Central Ave. Is okay. That, does that make, 
Does that yes, answer your right. question? Yes, not, right. Not, not the, the ones that are on Central. Right. right. Wouldn't have to sign anything. Right. 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 Now, um, how, how far off the homes is, will the berm begin? I'll leave that to John. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so if you, if you look at the diagram up here, um, I think it's, it, you know, it sort of, it's going to vary by the house, uh, but this sort of gives you an idea. So the berm is going to start very close to the house, but the top elevation is going to be about uh, 30 to 40 feet away from the house. Okay, all right. So it could start within 20 feet of the house? So right, so, so in places that have, where we have seawalls, it would start right against the seawall and go up from there. Um, and right. places okay. where, you, you know, where you're, you don't, you're not going to go carry it under the house, you're going to start right next, as close as you can to the house and go up from there. Yeah, I got to make sense. Understand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a house on the cliff, so I don't have the flooding. I don't have the flooding, luckily, but I've seen the damage that it's caused. This looks like a huge project, obviously, uh, and it may be in this information. I haven't gotten through all of it, but are, has this been done somewhere that we can look and see the success rate of it and the impact of, of this kind of project? Oh, sure. Um, well, I mean, you know, one of the things after the 78 storm, you can actually look, look up at Manhill Beach. It's probably not the most perfect example because it really is just a cobble berm, but that has lasted very well since the 78 storm. If you're looking for more of a mixed sediment uh, in Massachusetts, Winthrop Beach is a good example. So it's the east facing beach at Winthrop. Uh, if, if you fly in, you, uh, the five sisters, those five breakwaters at offshore, there's a beach nourishment that was constructed right behind those. And so it's this large a project? It's actually much larger. It's larger. Okay. Hi, I'm Diane Bennett. I live on Central Avenue, but 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 on Fourth Cliff, and I'm not on directly on the beach. However, what I have a problem with is that every single person on the beach has to sign the easement, and I think this project should go through whether or not everybody signs it because one person should not hold up this project especially because it's such a huge project and so expensive why should one family be able to hold up this project I think that's wrong so I think that you should reconsider that if you get more than 50% of the people that sign this, you go forward with this project because it's important. Do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I don't really necessarily disagree with you, um, but we'll have to look into what our legal options are with regards to what percentage. So. Yeah, this is a little bit more complicated than just a neighbor dispute. It's, right, I, I certainly understand. I, uh, my name is Peter Noyes. I'm at 35 Cliff Road South. My, my concern or my question is, and I didn't go to the previous presentations, at the Central Avenue Cliff Road split where the public beach access is, has there been coordination about any potential work that's going to be done on the Air Force Base at where the cliff is eroding as far as trying to prevent the scour from any armoring they do and the present um, armoring that's already there? Um, so, I mean, it, it's hard to, you know, there's a lot of issues that are going on, obviously, up at Fourth Cliff with the Air Force, thinking about armoring, et cetera. Um, I, you know, this project, you know, the way it's designed, you know, it's what we would call soft engineering. So it's adding materials. So really, it doesn't have any, in, there's no adverse impacts or scour related to it, um, but I also understand, you know, with the, the revetment that is on Cliff Road, just north of, of where the project is, you know, there, there is that that uh, revetment that's not in the best of shape, as I'm sure people up there know. Um, but I, I think that this project can basically stay independent of that. Um, and those projects that are actually armoring Fourth Cliff or, or dealing with some of the Fourth Cliff issues are are something that. Uh, you know, can be dealt with in a different way. So there really is no joining, but, you know, because this is a soft project, the material from this project may actually migrate along that shoreline to some extent and actually help protect some of the revetments up there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I? 
I, I hope I answered yeah. your question. And John, <laughs> I want to add to that. Um, the town met with the Air Force about a month ago because that property is under federal purview, uh, since it is Air Force property, um, especially with regards to a lot of the erosion. Uh, so they are looking into it. Uh, they, we are working both with our congressmen or our senators to make that a priority. Um, it's tough because it's not, it's a vacation uh, piece of property for the Air Force. So it doesn't always go to the top of the list uh, for attention. So we continue to work with them uh, to make sure that it, climbs up that list of importance um, so that they will address it and in, in, intend to some of the erosion that's taking place up there. Thank you. My, my only other comment is about the roadway. And um, obviously, I appreciate all the effort that you've gone through. And you've certainly done a lot of engineering. And I appreciate those that have signed the easements. And whatever happens, happens. But if the road is raised, could you consider the relative merits of extending the gas main? I believe the gas presently goes to Atlantic. and with 57 homes, it would seem to be a better alternative if they at least, if you at least consider the relative merits when you ex, uh, repair the water main of possibly bringing gas all the way to the base. Um, you know, again, I, I think a lot of this goes to, you know, if the project is completed all 4,800 feet or maybe even, you know, in the future extending further so that there's not a point where uh, the road is getting damaged. I'm sure that the gas company would be interested in, in doing just that, but I think that that's going to have to happen over time because you know, gas mains being exposed during storms is, is not something they, they like to deal with. So I, I think that that would just be something that would have to come with time. Um, concerning utilities in the roadway, um, we had a break in the water main, as you may know, at the very end of Fourth Cliff. And so the more utility we have in the roadway, the more troublesome and more expense to the community as a whole. Um, in order to fix that, we had an emergency to close off the valves, make sure that no more water was, you know, being expended to that area, and then it has to be repaired on the fly. So that was sheared off right at the end of Fourth Cliff. You could see the exposed water line after they lost eight feet off the off the north end. So adding more utilities to that road area um, is probably not something that I would advise the town to do. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lisa Case at 242 Central Ave. Uh, just a quick question about that. The uh, water main that broke was at the, the Air Force Base, so would that be an expense to the town or would that be absorbed by the feds? That's a good question. I don't know um, where, the, where the cost share will come in on that. It would be nice if they helped out a little bit. Um, <laughs> they are, uh, as Maura said. Yeah, I'm trying to think about um, that when we talked about that. I'll get back to you. I don't know who paid for the repair of that, um, right. but I would expect that the Air Force is being charged for it since it is up there around their, their cliff, but I'll double check for you, Lisa. I don't know the answer. Okay. Just, just. Um, okay, so my next question. So we're looking at phase one that ends at uh, 244 Central Ave. Um, approximately start date maybe within two years, maybe three, depending on uh, funding. And then what, another two or three years possibly to start phase two? Is that realistic? But no guarantee, of course. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. So, so right now, we're, we're in the point of, you know, if, if the community chooses to go forward, there's funding available, we would be pursuing phase one. Uh, you know, we are going through the process of an environmental notification form for the entire 4,800 feet. And so the other phases could come on very rapidly afterwards. So it's not, it's not something that is, needs two or three years for every phase to be put into effect. We are going through the process of, you know, getting this concept into permitting, and once, it's, once that phasing starts, it's a very easy thing to expand the project. So, I mean, it's basically on funding. If you can get funding sooner, the second phase will start sooner. 
Sooner, yes, and, yeah. and it will need to be permitted, but yes, I think that, that, you know, if this phase goes forward, it would be my recommendation for the town to actually permit the remainder of the project and, and then just as money becomes available, phase that in. Right, and of course, giving the obvious that all the, the easements are signed. Yes, and we'd, we would try to streamline as much as possible the funding and the environmental permitting as well, if, that, if, if we can find that's possible. We okay. will try to do that, to try to speed things up. Okay. And then as far as the uh, easements, um, nothing gets filed with the registry until the funding is re received. And then, of course, in this case, it would be the houses from 10 Cliff Road South down to 244. Then it would then get uh, registered. Um, as far as the addendum that somebody else was making reference to, um, is there any way of putting like a three or a four year, you know, if funding isn't received by then, rather than have an open-ended as far as the addendum. What addendum are you talking about, Lisa? I'm not the, uh, the one you were making reference to as far as if the funding and the easements were not all received and phase one wouldn't start, then um, the residents would receive their easements back and the um, easements would be null and void and it wouldn't become a public roadway that somebody else had uh, mentioned. So let me, let me see if I got this right. Um, you're asking if the extension to, to say that we would not file the easement until we had funding were in place. Is that yeah, the that, question you that, have? Yeah, the one I was confirming, the easements wouldn't be filed with the registry. So in other words, they wouldn't go into effect until all the funding has been received and so the, it can actually be done. Exactly. Yeah, okay. so by, by phase. Right. By phase. Okay. Yeah. And then the other thing was, is there a time frame where you know, people have to sign an easement and get funding. I mean, it won't be open-ended. You know, now you're in the eighth year waiting for maybe a couple more signatures. Um, so as we're phasing this in. We've given a date of September 1st for the first phase. So those homes from 10 Cliff to 244 Central are in that first phase. I will, we, the town is requiring them to be completed and returned to the town by September 1st. So you have the summer to consider it. Um, and then as we move along, if, as soon as we begin to find funding and move the, the first phase along, we will begin the second phase. And we'll come back to the homeowners, depending on whether it's a larger, Second phase is larger or s shorter, and ask those residents the same. Please sign an easement, and we'll give you a period of time to do so. But um, that's to move each phase along, and we'll try to stream that line that piece as well as we try the funding to try to make sure that we're doing this as in a quickest time period as possible. Okay, thank you. you and so then my next question is for the uh, homes that are not in within phase one, how is storm cleanup going to be handled? Because now all of a sudden this is going to be a whole different impact on those homes. Well, storm cleanup will be handled the same way. Obviously, we won't know until we see. I know what you're qu asking, because typically we dump it on the north end where we have that that area up there in the front, right? Up at the base of the bottom Central of Avenue. Cliff. Yeah. But we'll continue to clear the roadway as we do today during during the project. Hopefully nothing happens while it's happening. No, no, once phase one is done, now you have an elevated road uh, with the houses that have a nice berm in front of it. I, I, for those that don't know, the next house down the line is, is mine and my husband's. And we're looking at the, one of the biggest gaps between homes on Central Ave between 242 and 244, and now we have water coming in. Our house is on a foundation. The next five houses are on foundations, and we're going to get greatly impacted by an elevated road with water coming down, plus the water will be able to come through there. That could throw another whole mess into the works. Sure. John, can you speak to a little bit to that with yeah, so, regards so you're, to phase and the road elevation? Yeah, so you're concerned about if the road north of you is elevated and the berms there, that, that you're concerned about what flooding impacts that would have on your property? Is that, Correct. Okay. So, I mean, the whole purpose of this is, you know, obviously we, we talked about this, is if the roadway is up at elevation 10 north of you, 
um, you know, then the water can't get over the road, so it, it, it can't flood you either. So it doesn't, it's just because that road's higher, you still can get flooded from the south, but you can now anyways. We'll be able to get flooding from the west, the river's on the other side. So you can get flooding from the west now, correct? Uh, we don't, directly in front of our house, but two houses down where houses are sitting on foundations, Right. Do. I guess the thing is, I mean, with the way this is designed is, is that the area that would be done would not flood from the front, would not flood from the back, but it's not going to redirect any floodwaters to anybody else. It's just protecting the properties that we're doing the work in front of or right. behind. But it'll flood from the ocean. What will flood from the ocean? I'm because 244 has the, will have a berm and there'll be a, a gap between that and our house and the water will come through there. But the, wa the water comes through there now. I mean, the, the, the elevation of your home is lower than, so it's not going to change the amount of water that's coming where you are uh, just because there's shore protection done north of there. You know, that's, that's basically like if, I mean, you could look at it a different way. If they, they just put a vertical barrier up all the way up there, that's not going to change the amount of volume of water that's, that's going over the area uh, from your house south. You know, that, that is just coming over from the ocean. Well, without the berm, the water has a lot of places to come under houses on pilings. Now, the only place it's going to have is the gap between their property and ours, and then it'll come full through their full force. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, the, the, way, the way that these waves are going to come over. So, I mean, if water is coming, let's say at, uh, you know, let, let's say 260 Central Avenue, I mean, it, it's, it, and it hits the berm, it's dissipated. The energy is dissipated on the berm. So all of a sudden doesn't increase the amount of flow that's going in between 244 and 242. Um, you know, it's not like all of a sudden there's a, a river that wants to get through there. This is, this whole concept of this berm is to dissipate the wave energy on the ocean side, and all of a sudden that energy's gone for those properties that have the berm in front of them. The, the places that will get the berm in the future will also get that when they have the berm, but it's not like all of a sudden there's this, you know, we're not talking about riverine flooding where there's this big pond that builds up and there's gonna flow through a, a very small area because we only did a partial project. You know, this is wave energy. Wave energy, it's, again, we're trying to treat this like a natural berm system that dissipates the wave energy. So that wave energy is gonna be dissipated in the area where we have the project and it's not going to exacerbate any problems further south. It's, you, the way your area is gonna be further south is the way it is now until a project's done. When the water comes over from the ocean and comes through, it usually travels north of us to get to the, the river. That will now be blocked by an elevated road and a berm, which will give it only the path directed at our house is the path of least resistance to come through. You know, the, the reason why that water travels through now is because that area is obviously a slightly lower elevation than where you are, if that's where it's going. If that elevation is built up, again, the, the wave energy is going to be dissipated and it's not going to want to flow across anywhere else other than some other weak spot that's further south that is already getting flooded now. I mean, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not quite sure I, I can explain it to you any better. I'm, it's okay, not let, me, let me advance to the next step, maybe it'll be more clear. So the storm cleanup for the homes that are, no, that are not going to be in phase one will continue to be the same, which means that the town will deposit massive piles of cobble and sand in your driveways, which now again block the water, which then sends it towards your house. So now you have an elevated road, a smaller area is coming through, and the town is still coming through and dumping massive piles of cobble and just trapping the water and sending it towards the house. So and that's how all these houses fl flooded last winter. Right, so I mean, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, the, the way that the town maintains this is they plow the road, and yes, there, there is times when it's directed towards your house, but that's not changing anything that doesn't exist now. There's not gonna be more water directed towards your house. You're just not in the project area, so you're basically dealing with what you're dealing with now. There's no, I mean, and then in the future, assuming people sign easements and the project moves forward, then you would receive the protection and then you wouldn't have that problem. Okay, there's a berm that's above our seawall. 
Lisa? So, yes. Can we, I, I think we understand that you have um, a lot of detailed questions. We got a lot of people here. John's gonna be here after the, the general session and we've got a lot of designs. Can you ask a little bit more? I know you wanna really understand this and I don't blame you. Well, it's, I not, would it's as just well. not me. I mean, there, there are many neighbors that are concerned based on what happened this past winter and the thousands of dollars of damage that it caused to them because those houses are all on foundations. They're really frightened about the outcome of how, how this is going to play out. So I think we need to have those conversations so they can understand the project. Okay. And then as far as the dredging, uh, I was asked to see if it would be reconsidered about dumping it offshore. I know this is a Nancy question. And, and instead put it back on the beach. Lost your opportunity. Well, um, as you may know, this uh, South River Dredge project was moved up in time. I think I sent letters to every homeowner on Central Ave explaining that this hazardous conditions in the South River had warranted us to move that project forward. Um, we needed to get in there and dredge out at least Section A, which is the confluence of the North and the South River, where we we're concerned with boaters beaching on um, where it's shoaled and all of that material is now uh, still needs to be removed. So because of that, and there were no easements um, that were provided to the town, we cannot put the material on the beach similar to the project without the easements. So the project had to move forward. So we're now in our permit phase. We've applied to Army Corps and DEP, as you know, conservation, and we'll go to ZBA as well um, to get those permits moved forward. And we're trying to get to Section A as soon as possible. It's looking possibly by fall of this year to get that section done and more if we have more funding available to us. Right now, we have funding just for Section A. So that has to move forward. Okay, it will be and then one last forward. question relevant to that. There were easements signed by residents that were given to DPW for material to go on the beach that were, were given to Kevin Cafferty. There was like 35 of these. And residents had signed them as uh, to be proactive. Instead of having things wait till the last minute before a storm was forecasted, they wanted the town to know that, yes, we have no problem for doing this. Um, so th they were confused on how come those couldn't be utilized. Was that a con I'm not sure if that's a construction easement or whether or not that's a permanent easement. A permanent easement is required for a public project. Temporary doesn't work in this particular situation. So I'm not sure what those easements are about. It's similar to what the town had used for dredging. That was why. I'll speak to that for you. Okay. Okay. I okay. don't. Okay. Uh, you, you'd have to ask Kevin, and I could certainly work with you and talk to Kevin okay. as well. But Thank you very much. Not, Thank I'm not familiar with those easements. Okay, great. Thanks for all the work you guys are doing. I can speak to that for you. Okay. Um, as regards the previous speaker, in terms of um, the town putting stuff on the property, I've talked to DPW several times, and uh, over five, six years, I've signed those forms, allowing them to go on the property and take material off uh, if they chose to do it, if they have the funding. Didn't say that in the letter. But they did it once. Matter of fact, they did it very well for all my neighbors, and they didn't do very well for me the year they did it. My complaint is they push an awful lot on some properties. I know down near the cliff it's terrible, but they push an awful lot of some, on some properties, and some properties get nothing. And what happened to me this year, they so blocked me in so solidly across the lot that the water had nowhere to flow that was still coming, so I suffered more damage on the back than normal. Now, I don't know who I complain to for that, but when I talked to DPW uh, on several occasions, I even asked them, I didn't get a form this year. Now, if they sent one, I, I didn't get it or didn't see it, because it comes to a, another residence, but uh, the business of cleaning the, the debris that the town pushes up is left to the homeowner, according to DPW, except when they choose to do it when they have the funding, which didn't happen. And we have given them those yearly 
uh, uh, easements to, in, in a sense, go on the property to do that. So to respond as best I could to what you just asked, I would like to make a comment which was, which was said something by you also, ma'am, but this whole business of the road elevation, it's my understanding from last year's meetings that the road elevation is intended to protect us from the river, not from the ocean. Uh, so uh, I get the river coming at us now, not with any force, but it does flood the road, and it's eroding. On the other hand, it's my understanding, if there's any confusion, and I was not sure what you were getting at, ma'am, but when you spoke of the, the flow and, and your response with the wave dissipation, uh, I don't know, I, I understood what you said, I don't know if I entirely believe it, but I would, I would, I would think there'd be some resistance and reaction that the water would move somewhat, maybe not markedly, but I would think somewhat. But uh, at, 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 at any rate, uh, to respond, I, I uh, would just like to say it was certainly made clear last year that the elevation of the road uh, is only going to proceed if the sand dunes go through. And the elevation of the road is intended only to protect us from the river. Just to clarify that point, which. Thank you. All right. All right, Bob. Mary Goodwin, 160 Central. Uh, I've only been summering in Humrock since 1965, so I'm a newbie in this crowd probably. But I just wanted to make a quick comment and say that for years we were told we couldn't put any of the sand back on the beach. And I just feel that it's just ruined the beach because here we are with the river. You know, it, it's too high. It's, it's causing as much damage as the ocean. And there's so much sand everywhere. It's just like we should have been putting it back on the beach all those years. That's all I just wanted to say. Thank you. Does anybody else have any additional questions for John or myself or Nancy? Rich Feely, 286 Central. I was at the meeting last year at the uh, South Humrock building, and the question came that if the project doesn't go forward, that the um, easements will be withdrawn. Where's the language that says that? So we covered that a little bit earlier, and that I had answered saying that we will check in with town council and the town administrator to see where that le that information can be added for you, so that it is contingent upon the funding. But I do believe that was asked last year, and it hasn't been acted upon yet. So at the time that you asked that question, our town administrator resigned, and it's taken, and we rehired a town administrator who started in January. So as you could imagine, there are a lot of things on his plate. So certainly this is a priority, and will be revisited with him again. Okay. For the first time for his. I okay. say again for us, first time for him. So we have between now and September 1st to sign, but you don't have a language that's going to make me confident of giving an easement. So the language of the easement probably won't sign, but probably a cover letter that carry, that goes along with it that will be put on file. That is how it was explained to me last summer that it would be handled. So if we need to reconstruct that easement, I think it will only involve putting a cover letter with it, identifying the funding issue that you raise. Okay. So I don't anticipate that the structure of the easement will change too much. Just, and that's just based on our past town council advice. Okay. But I would expect to have that letter prior to signing an easement. Absolutely. So do we expect to have that in the next two months, which only leaves us a month to look at it? No, we'll take a look at it immediately. Thank you. And my other question is, you clearly put in this easement that the town's got no obligation to maintain this berm. So what is going to happen three, five, seven years after the berm's built and it's falling apart, and the town's going to just wash its hands and say, we have no money, which is what I hear every year about cleaning up Central Avenue, which this year is a disaster. 
So what happens with regards to when you do um, an engineered berm, we also have um, other financial resources through federal funds. That's one of the quote unquote beauties of engineered berms and beaches and that's why we're going down this route because we have other resources to look to besides just the town levying your taxes to clean the roads. Um, so with regards to putting maintaining it in the easement, I actually I have to reread it. I don't have it in front of me right now. It clearly says in the easement the town is under no obligation in the future to maintain it. I wish that language was not in it. I wish it was the other way and says the town is obligated to maintain this since we're giving up our rights to our beach. I'll take a look at it. Thank you. Just so you know that the easement language went through quite a dif different variations, as you know, because you've worked through this with me, and I appreciate all of the patience that you've had. It has been very difficult to write an easement language that pleases everyone. Um, this easement is the exact same easement that all the residents along Oceanside Drive had to sign for their seawall. Same exact language. It's not different for, for you than it is for them. The only difference is that it doesn't say a seawall, it says a beach or dune. Well, putting your seawall in is not the same as a dune. That's not even an equal comparison. It still allows people to be on the beach in front of the seawall and on the seawall as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm Diane Bennett. I live on Central Avenue on Fourth Cliff. What I'd like to know is, is it possible this evening to have a raise of hands of the people? I don't know how many houses are between on phase one. How many houses? 30, 40? The ones that go down to li li Linda's house. 35. 35? Are there 35 people who live between 10 Cliff Road and Lisa's house? Can you raise your hands if you're here? One, two, three, four. Four people, so where are the rest of the 31 people who are impacted by this? Why aren't they here? And that's the problem with your language that if one person says they're not gonna do it, that the whole project falls apart. And this is what I have a problem with because I live up on Fourth Cliff and I had to walk out last winter. I understand your frustration. No, nope, because they're not here. I, I understand. It's they're not here. So that's not John's fault. No. Um, it's not Nancy's fault. But There's been... language that says if one person doesn't do it, we can't go. We're a village. We're a community. We should all be together. I don't disagree with you that we're a village and a community, but unfortunately, it's uh, people have private rights to their property right now, so we have to ensure that we have access. There are situations in municipal government where we can get 75% of a particular project. I don't know that that applies to this, but I certainly will look into it because I don't disagree with your concern. Every single person you have You're absolutely correct. Uh, how, how many people have signed the easement so far? You have that, Nance? I do. Um, I have nine. Nine? Nine. And how many? Three, three in my target area and four promises that they will sign once we get to the point um, um, of, many, how of many, this how, point. How many, how many total signatures are there? There are 37 properties in the target area. Five of them are on the riverside, so they don't need to sign the easement. I have n three easements signed in this area, and I have four people who have promised to sign it but have not provided it yet. So that leaves me with 25 properties left. So though it appears that many people may not have come, they do contact me. They can't always be here because they don't necessarily live in town or they also have other obligations, so they can't be here. I know there are a few residents who had other places to be, and that's why they're not here, but they are, they are interested. Um, 
I have to believe that we have an opportunity here. And I think that people were waiting to see the engineered designs. I truly believe that the residents were concerned about what this would look like, how it would affect my property. I don't understand the roadway. I don't understand how high the dune will be. These are the things that we decided back in last year that were still issues. And we said we would come back with the engineered designs and give you more details so that you could make a decision that was educated and that you were comfortable with. And that is what we're at right now. And now we just have to decide if you really want this project to move forward, that you have to sign the easement with the language that is stated with the caveat that there may be a cover letter stating that should this not go forward, um, you will not have an easement registered at the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds. Yes, okay. Part, yep. I just want to add as well, so we came up against this when we were doing the seawall project as well along Oceanside, and we engaged the Coastal Coalition, um, who I would assume in Hummer Rock you have a very strong presence on that coalition as well, um, which is the one that Dave Ball heads up in his group. Um, they were very effective in working with the residents, so I would ask that if there are folks here from the Coastal Coalition, if you want to come forward later on and speak with Nancy or myself, to help us through that education process. Uh, the coalition seems to be very close to the folks that may not necessarily be here all the time and may not necessarily be getting all this information, but they were very critical and helpful when we needed to secure that, that last easement to do the Oceanside seawall. And I can't tell you how many residents came to us this winter to say thank you. To say thank you. And we even had a resident come afterwards and we extended the wall another 30 or 40 feet because they saw the benefits of what their neighbors were getting. So I just put that out there for food for thought. Uh, I, I, I don't think there's any, any, any doubt by anybody and I'm, I'm only one of three in that 35 that are here um, that if nothing is done, uh, North Hamarok will be an island one day. I don't think anybody doubts that. Um, I think the problem is, and I had a conversation with Nancy during the winter, following up with this gentleman over here. <clears throat> it, was, it was a year ago that we talked about, we signed the easement, what if it doesn't take place? Do we get the easements sent back? And the answer then was, we're going to look into it. And it's a year later, and we're still looking into it. But you're putting the pins on everybody to get this done within 60 days with the um, polite threat that if it doesn't get done, there are other projects for which you're going to spend the money. So uh, there's an implied threat that if the easements aren't signed, this isn't going to get done and you guys will be an island. Except a year ago, you said the same thing. So there was a new, I'm not sure, town administrator that came in in January, and now we're in almost July. When is this going to get done? A minute before sure. September 1st? No. Nope. So I own that. So you're right. We should have taken a look sooner um, with regards to that language. So I commit to you that we will look at it sooner rather than later. And it's not a threat. It, nobody's oh, it, it here, was, no, it, it, it nobody's is, here threatening you, sir. <laughs> it's just a fact. That's all it is. It's not a threat. It's a fact. It's what we as a town and we as public servants, the laws and the rules that we have to follow with regards to state regulations and how we proceed to working on our coastline. It's just not a threat, but we have $90 million worth of projects that we need to address. So we can't continue to delay, 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 you know, the issues at Peggotty, the issues in Sand Hills, the issues on Oceanside, while we've decided to focus on Hummer Rock, we need to put a stake in the sand. Sorry to use that phrase, but we do. But it's not a threat, and I apologize if you take it that way. It's just a course that we need to take and make a decision to either move forward or not. And what I'm suggesting is that we wouldn't be repeating the same things a year later had things been clarified and um, the residents had some kind of comfort level. The winter discussion over the phone that I had with Nancy was my perception of the last two meetings was that 
um, there's a um, lack of trust from what the residents are hearing from the town and yet they're being told they have to sign this easement for this to go forward so now that hasn't changed and that has always been part of this project we've always had to have an easement for the public dollars that will be spent on this project that requires a public benefit. That has not changed. We've continually told you that. We have worked together with the Board of Selectmen and the Town Administrator, uh, Trisha Casey, Van Casey, when she was here over the last summer. And then we met with you at the end of the summer, right as you were rolling out, um, probably around Labor Day, to talk to you about the easement then. I said we would do the engineering designs which took longer than we had anticipated. And we also saw a storm in January and mostly the month of March. We had a new town administrator who started January 4th. He was here, uh, started first, right after the first, he was here, his first day was a storm. So he has had a lot on his plate to get ready. Um, we have also just seen, you know, the engineering designs as well and we, are ready to show them to you and answer the questions that you had, which we had promised back this last summer when we met. I said, uh, you have specific questions that can't be answered until we have engineered designs, and here we are. We have the engineered designs. I apologize that they took longer than we had anticipated. There's also lack of data uh, within the town. We didn't have uh, septic plans for every property, which made it difficult for engineering purposes. And so some of that held it up as well. Not to mention that the month of March, I was pretty much walking your coastline, looking at everyone's damage, as well as the structure's damages all along the coast. And I have to say, the whole entire coast frightens me right now, based on the storms that I saw in March. I was waking up in the middle of the night, and I, I kid you not, saying, I can't fix this. So if you can't help us with just signing an easement, we can't fix this problem. The, all the problems that you're talking about today, all the material in the road, how much of a, you know, ink, you know how difficult it is, that's not going to go away if we don't do the project. That will only continue and exasperate as time goes on. I, I don't think, and I don't. Ha, it's in your power right now to make that decision and sign an easement so that we can move the project forward. I'm assuming that once you see the success of the northern end, those people to the south will also want to sign as well and be part of the project, which is what makes the phasing of this project s slightly better for everyone. It's hard to get my head wrapped around 80 easements when I have six, or I'm sorry, nine in my files out of 80. I, I don't think anybody, as I said before, doubts that something has to be done. What ha what's changed between a year ago and now is the clock is down to 60 days. And Right, but I'm, the same easement I'm not language sure. is the exact same language well, that you've had with the in your files. I have a problem with the cover year. letter, frankly speaking. It's not part of the document. I have a problem with that. And um, I, I, I'm not sure, perhaps other people think the same way, what is going to pop into my head in the next 60 days that hasn't popped into my head in the last two years. I, I don't need 60 more days. Nothing new has come about. In fact, I'm hearing things I don't like because a, because a year ago I thought that the easement itself, the language in, in the easement itself, you were, going to, you were going to consult legal counsel for that. There was in fact a lawyer sitting in the front row on the last meeting in September and you were going to consult legal counsel to change the wording in the easement and now I'm hearing that sometime between now and 60 days we're going to have a cover letter and I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not sure if the cover letter is going to be legally binding for the easement. So the board did look at the easement language, I want to say last September, if my memory serves me right, and approved the easement language that you have in the copy that was distributed and that you've seen. So I will commit to you on those last issues that you raise, as I did 15 minutes ago, 
that I will sit down with the town administrator this week so that this doesn't lag any further to give you a final response, whether that needs to be in the cover letter so it's on file at the Registry of Deeds with the easement, or is it actually able to be in the easement itself? And again, that language will have to go before the entire board, which I am one of five people who vote on that. But I will commit to you that I will take care of that because I want this project to move forward as well. So a lot of us lose sleep. I know you lose the most sleep living there and, and living and breathing it. But trust me that your town officials and your town employees here who work hard every day care very deeply about this and we're trying to do the best thing for you to resolve this. So Great. I will commit to you those two things. I'd just like to describe the process of filing an easement. So basically what I will do is take your sign and notarized document to the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds. I will provide that to them along with any information about the, the deed itself, the number, where it can be located within the deed records. The, the Registry of Deeds will then time stamp the document on site. If you have ever been to the Registry of Deeds and had to record anything, they will take the document, they will stamp it. It is time stamped to the date and the actual time that I'm standing in front of the desk at the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds. That is your proof in my mind that that is when the deed will be recorded. We will hold on to the deeds until we have the funding because I have no reason and the town has no reason to move forward on an easement on a project that we don't intend to build. So if we have the money, that's the time that I would be going towards the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds and then filing your easement language and signed and notarized document with them and not until. Ms. Currens, thank you very much for those kind words um, with regard to the Coastal Coalition and David's group, David Ball's group. And I'd just like to advise everyone here that if they'd like to uh, uh, join uh, the Coastal Coalition, the next meeting will be July 11th at 6.30 at the Hummer Rock Civic Association. Everyone's invited. Bob, do you have a question? No, seriously. Do you have a question for any of us? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I'd, okay. I'd like to make a comment about the easements again. It wasn't last September, but I think it was about a year ago in the spring, uh, about this time, at, uh, down at the new police station, uh, was I think the first meeting I attended. And although the easements were not an issue to me because of my location facing uh, the river, um, it was very clear, and as much as I'm on your side, <laughs> it was very clear at that meeting that almost everyone got up and said that the language stinks in that letter. And it was agreed by everyone that they would look at it and respect the majority opinion that, that specific things needed to be changed. And now I'm hearing nothing changed. So I remember a year ago, not in September, I wasn't at that meeting, but I do remember a year ago when the whole business of the language of the easements was raised, and boy, did I agree with them. And, and the promises were made that that was going to be brought to the attention of, of some town clerk, of, I, I, I use the term loosely, but I mean some person, um, employee, who, who had some functionary uh, uh, business, and I don't care what some other area has or what some other area has, the majority of the people that you're looking to get to some, some support for uh, asked wow. for, some sp from, for some specific changes that seemed very reasonable and, and not a big deal, to, to, at least to me, an average person. Bob, and, and now I'm finding hang on, hang that, on, that, hang that on, that hasn't hang changed. On, hang on. I take full responsibility because I was the person that presented at that meeting. So I said I would go and talk to the town administrator and other people within the community that had more authority than myself. And I think that's pretty much the terms that I used at that meeting. I did not make any promises about what the language would look like. 
Well, we understand that, but okay. but nonetheless, no, no, the, 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 I don't think I don't think it was yeah. communi- I mean, if the people have the same problems, I mean, I think that has to be addressed, and, and I think the concerns, you know, for the most part, are legitimate. I don't see that that just because in some the other area the language is different that some exception couldn't be made given the enormity and, and the importance of the project. I, I'm not trying to be a rabble riser. I, I understand. Uh, all right. So, Thank you. Right. Thank you. I, I, that was just my impression from a year ago, and it seems like we're at the same point. No, because we, we do have final language in the easement. This is fine. The, the language that you see that was uh, provided to you on the table that has been provided to you at the meeting that we had in, in September of last year is the final language. As I mentioned, it is the same language that residents on the Oceanside Drive seawall had to sign as well. The only difference is that it's a beach and a dune and not a seawall. That's the only difference. And so what was determined was that the language should be the same because we we had people who didn't want to sign on Oceanside Drive. In fact, we have a section that was not completed because residents refused to sign the easement. So then we moved to another section where people would sign them. And that's what happened on the Oceanside Seawall um, easement language. And it's the exact same language that we forced other residents to sign that you feel like we're forcing you to sign as well. But it is a part of the permitting process that is a requirement for any funds, as we've said. If we're going to take people's money from other parts of the state, other parts of your community, possibly other parts of the country, then there is an easement that is required for that benefit. And that's, that's where we're at. I apologize. I take full responsibility for the length of time that the easement seems to have appeared to have taken. And that maybe it doesn't feel like it was a success to everyone. And I have to say, it's not, there's not going to be language that's going to please every person. Sometimes there's a compromise in the middle, and I'm hoping that we're reaching that place soon. I'm hoping that we'll come together and you'll be able to sign um, this easement with whatever we can come up with for the cover letter for that. Yeah, it's the only thing I'll say. Is, I mean, I mean have, I, I, I'm, yeah, my from my perspective, 260 Central Avenue, it's not about the easement. I'll sign the easement. I, I, I've been waiting, and I've, been, I've talked to you no less than a dozen times, maybe, I'm calling you. I've been waiting for the final drawings. You know, any, any homeowner here is not going to sign anything until we get the final drawings. And so here we are. So now that we have the final drawings, I think hopefully people can make their decision to sign the easements. I think the language in, in, in some ways is sort of um, minor compared to what we're dealing with. So. so, thank you, everyone. I don't see any other hands raised. So for takeaways from this meeting, um, you've got a great presentation and design up here that's been outlined. I encourage you to share it with those 30 residents that aren't here this evening who will be impacted uh, first and foremost. Um, we'll put it up online. It's already online. Look at how efficient Nancy is. It's already online for folks to go up there, download it, share it with your neighbors, as well as Nancy has a very extensive email list, so we will get everything in front of them. Number two, I will sit down with the town administrator this week, review your concerns that I hear from some of the residents, and we will get back some communication to you as soon as possible. The next Board of Selectmen meeting is next Tuesday. so. I am not hopeful because we probably are going to have to have it reviewed by town council first. So it may be two more cycles of board meetings before I can get anything additional there. But I, I hear your concerns there, um, and I will make sure that those are addressed. And hopefully they will be, they will please you. So. I can't promise you, I just can only say that I hope that they will. Um, and then Nancy, uh, I don't know if you have any other takeaways, um, but those are my action items. And again, please know that we are committed to working through this to solve this issue. We do not want to see Hummer Rock become an island. Um, that is why, and I, I think we all know that it's destined to go that way, um, and we don't want to see that happen. So please know that we are working diligently on your behalf so that you can reside on beautiful Hummer Rock 
for many, many, many more years to come. And so that next storm doesn't take your homes out um, prior to us getting this done. And we're trying to move it along as quickly as possible. And I want to thank John and his team and everyone um, for their patience and listening to the easement issue. You know, he's concerned that the design's going to work. Um, so, but he, uh, I want to thank you for your patience and answering all those questions because I know folks get very concerned about water channeling and whatnot. Um, it's a big concept to kind of grasp. It's something different that um, we're not all used to. So thank you, John, for entertaining those questions and for helping residents understand. Anything else, Nancy? So thank you again. Thank you very much. And um, we look forward to receiving 35 easements on September 1st.